Each professor's grading policies reflect their own beliefs about student learning, motivation, and success. Grading policies often vary across campus, within individual departments, and even between instructors in the same department teaching the same course. Faculty may believe that their grading practices are fair, but oftentimes policies inadvertently perpetuate achievement disparities. While grades can be more indicative of how an individual instructor grades than a valid assessment of student learning, there are more serious considerations to grading regarding equity. Traditional grading approaches often advantage privileged students while disadvantaging historically underserved students, which can interfere with retention and success efforts. In this workshop, we'll explore research-based grading practices that promote equity and examine why certain policies may contribute to achievement gaps. I'll be your presenter today. My name is Amanda Smothers, and I'm the Teaching and Learning Coordinator in the Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning at NIU. Our workshop goals for today are to discuss the following issues related to fairness, consistency, and transparency in grading with an eye toward equity. Aligning grading with your teaching philosophy. Articulating your teaching philosophy is the first step in this process. Grading equitably. How can you create an equitable grading system? How can you determine whether your current grading system is equitable? Policies for late assignments. What are some of the equity issues involved in late work policies? What are some examples of equitable late work policies? Effective communication. Having a grading process and policies that are created with equity in mind is great, but students have to be aware that the, of those policies in order for them to be truly fair, consistent, and transparent. Grading rubrics. Grading rubrics are one grading tool that could help you develop fair grading practices by standardizing your grading and helping you focus on established criteria and levels of performance when grading student work or performance. And then finally, providing feedback. Providing timely feedback is essential to establishing equitable grading practices. Feedback throughout the learning process is essential for student learning. One step toward making your grading system more equitable is by aligning your grading system with your teaching philosophy. You may need to articulate your teaching philosophy before you can articulate your grading philosophy. There are a lot of online tools that can help you find your teaching philosophy, which we won't cover here, but I encourage you to seek out those tools, particularly if you've never developed or articulated your teaching philosophy, or if it's been a long time since you've revisited it. Some questions you wanna consider when you're aligning your grading system with your teaching philosophy are, what are the most important things you want your course grading system to accomplish for you? What are the most important things you want your course grading system to accomplish for your students? What do your grades represent? For example, do your grades represent student mastery of established learning objectives, or do they represent students' performance relative to their peers? Which do you think is fairer and more consistent? Do you believe only a certain number of students should be able to achieve an A in your course, or do you believe in commending students' demonstration of learning by conferring a commensurate grade? Could your current grading policies be contributing to equity gaps? Do you believe student work should be assessed based on a specific set of criteria, criterion grading, or do you believe student work should be assessed in terms of how it measures up against the work of other students, normative grading? How might criterion grading be more equitable than normative grading? And do you believe in assessing grade penalties for late work and other infractions? Why or why not? How might this affect equity in your grading practices? In an article by Katrina Schwartz, How Teachers Are Changing Grading Practices with an Eye on Equity, physics teacher Nick Sigmund points out, students are very much aware that school is a game and that your grades aren't based on how well you understand something, but on how well you play the game. Sigmund goes on to say that it's easy to get defensive about your grading policy or get defensive about those ideas. As a teacher, you wanna believe that you're doing the right thing and that your grades are meaningful and that you've figured out a system of grading that makes sense. Sigmund describes his new thoughts about grading, saying, I have to be more thoughtful. My grades now are meant to be an accurate reflection of a student's mastery of the standards set by the state in high school physics, Sigmund said. If a student can display their knowledge of those standards without doing the homework, he shouldn't be penalized for that in his grade, especially because students all have different responsibilities outside of school that can make getting homework done difficult. Some tips for grading for equity in the aforementioned article, as well as other resources, include to grade by standard rather than by ass assignment. This involves assessing whether students are mastering standards or course objectives rather than receiving points simply for completing assignments. Ditch homework and extra credit grades. 
This goes along with the previous tip, which is that students are graded based on their progress toward established standards or objectives, rather than encouraging points grabs for smaller homework assignments and extra credit. By moving away from that type of grading, the goal is that students will see that the only way to improve their grade is by mastering the objectives. Ensure grades reflect what students know, not whether they're compliant. In other words, emphasize mastery rather than behavior management in your grading practices. Should students be getting a grade based on how compliant they are, or should they be assessed based on their mastery of course objectives? Which do you think is fairer? Think about whether your grading practices inadvertently punish students with fewer resources. For example, a student who comes into your classroom with not less content knowledge or preparation from previous schooling may need to make more effort and revise an assignment more times or take an exam more times to master the course content than someone coming into your course with more resources and preparation from prior educational experiences. Should the former student who ends the course having mastered the content be punished by always having a lower grade than the latter student who also ends the course having mastered the content but who began the course by earning better grades because they had more resources? Is averaging grades an equitable practice in light of this scenario? Consider whether you should be grading student participation. What are you looking for when you assess whether students are quote unquote participating? Eye contact, note taking, speaking up in class, not having side conversations while you're lecturing or giving instructions. How might these elements of so-called participation reveal inequity? For example, if eye contact is a criteria for participation, how are students who feel uncomfortable with or are unable to make eye contact, whether for cultural reasons, because they're autistic, because they have a visual impairment or blindness, or for some other reason, affected by this policy they cannot adhere to? How might this be unfair to those students? How might your unintentional bias toward the learning style you prefer be affecting your students' grades? Require retakes if students earn below a certain grade. This encourages students to continue the learning process rather than just earning a poor grade and moving on. If one of our goals in teaching is to facilitate student learning, we need to think outside of the box for ways to do that, and this is one possible strategy. Students who earn a grade that indicates mastery and demonstrates their learning goals are met do not have to retake the exam. Students who fall below mastery or do not demonstrate that learning goals have been met need to take another look at the course material, continue the learning process, and retake the assessment to determine whether they've progressed. The new grade would replace the old grade, not be averaged with it, because the more recent grade represents the student's mastery and learning progress. Provide individual assessment for group work, not a group grade. Collaboration is important, so group work shouldn't be avoided. However, a group grade doesn't indicate whether individual students have mastered the standards. That's why to be fair and equitable and have students' grades reflect their learning, individual grades should be assigned for group work. This also helps with the common problem of one or two students doing all the work and the rest of the students earning the same grade. And then despite faculty's efforts to be objective, grading students can involve personal bias. Anonymous grading, which is grading assessments without knowing the identity of the student, is one way to combat personal biases. While not all professors and instructors are explicitly racist or biased towards students of color, for example, it's very difficult for anyone to overcome implicit biases completely. These biases may creep into our grading if we know the identities of the students as we grade, so anonymous grading is one strategy to help make our grading process more objective and reduce the chances that our implicit biases may unfairly influence students' grades. Finally, going back to the quotation on the previous slide, consider what your goals are for grading and student learning. Should students' grades be based on how well they know something or whether they can play the proverbial game? Policies for late assignments. One grading policy you'll want to consider through an equity-minded lens is your late work policy. Some questions you might want to consider are, what do your grades represent? How well students are learning or their compliance with the rules? What assumptions do you make when students don't turn in work? And what is the reality? How can you find out? What might be some obstacles students are facing? For example, anxiety, executive functioning skill gaps, lack of necessary resources, or external professional or personal obligations. How should we address equity issues such as these while not penalizing students because we assume they're just unmotivated? Are you grading too many things? Can you switch to grading just summative assessments and providing feedback on formative assessments but not giving a grade for those smaller assignments? How can you encourage students to do ungraded formative work and see the value in it?
what kind of grading system is realistic for you? What's a grading plan that's manageable so that you're not behind on your grading? If you're behind on your grading, how are students expected to see the value in turning in their own work on time? Finally, is letting students turn in piles of late work just to get points pointless? If we switch to just providing feedback on formative assessments and do not enter them in a grade book, will they be more meaningful for learning? Some options you might want to consider for equity in your late policy include extension requests. How can students request an extension? Could you implement an online form to standardize the process? Do students have to prove they need an extension? What equity issues might that proof introduce into your grading practices? Could students instead be required to reflect on why they need an extension so they can determine whether it's in their power to solve problems that might be getting in the way of their success? Another option is late passes. Could students be given a certain number of late passes for assignments in a semester? In other words, students can turn in a certain number of assignments late within a reasonable time frame in case of life circumstances. Another option is floating deadlines, also called flexible due dates. This involves providing a range of due dates for work. For example, offering students incentives to turn in work early, such as getting a more thorough or early feedback on an assessment or allowing resubmissions with revisions for early submissions. Another option is work in progress. So allowing students to submit assignments that aren't yet completed is one way to see how students are progressing. For example, you could have students provide you with links to works in progress um, in their OneDrive so that you can check in on their work before it's due and provide feedback that might help them succeed. And then optional or self-selected homework. This involves not grading homework, but rather providing it as an opportunity for students to learn and progress toward course outcomes ahead of graded assessments. This option involves work on the faculty member's part to help students see the value in completing this work. And part of the value added is that the faculty member is providing substantive and meaningful feedback on students' optional or self-selected homework. Regardless of what your grading policies are, it's essential to communicate those policies to students clearly and effectively so that they understand how their academic performance will translate to their course grade. Demystifying your grading system is an important step toward equity. Important elements of what you communicate to students should include the following. Explaining the grading process. How do assignments or assessments align with learning materials and activities? How do they align with the course objectives? How will students be involved in the grading process? Who will do the grading? How will you ensure that grading is consistent and fair? Explaining your grading policies, due dates, late work, grading scale, grading on a curve. Uh, explaining grading criteria, so what elements students will be graded on, what the levels of performance look like, how the criteria are weighted in the overall grade. Also explaining grading tools. Will there be a rubric, a checklist, rating scale, self-assessment? And then finally, returning work in a timely manner. Have a policy and adhere to it and communicate if you need to veer from it. One grading tool that can help us become more fair in our grading practices and communicate more clearly our expectations to students is the grading rubric. What can rubrics do? Rubrics help us to set anchor points along a quality continuum so that we can set reasonable and appropriate expectations for students and more consistently judge how well they've met them. Rubrics also divide an assignment into its component parts and provide a detailed description of what constitutes different levels of performance for each part, which shows students how they can succeed on the, the assessment. What can rubrics do for you and your students? They can function as an instructional and evaluation tool. They can facilitate timely feedback, refine your teaching by better organizing or defining your expectations for students, facilitate communication between you and your students, prepare and guide students' work, and assess student mastery of learning objectives. Ultimately, rubrics help to promote fair, consistent, and transparent assessment and evaluation practices. Some considerations that you'll want to address when creating or selecting a pre-existing rubric include the following questions. Does the rubric align with your course outcomes or objectives? Does the rubric include performance levels? Does the rubric describe what students need to do to master the criteria? Do the rubric criteria reflect current notions of mastery in your field? Are rubric scores well-defined? Is the rubric fair and bias-free? Does the rubric allow for inter-rater reliability? And is the rubric useful, practical, and manageable? Aside from providing students with information about their grades using rubrics, we can use feedback to provide students with more details about how they can improve their learning progress. 
To address equity issues and gaps in our courses, we need to try to provide students with equitable opportunities to learn and progress toward mastery of learning outcomes. Providing substantive and constructive feedback is an important way to do that. However, not all feedback is equally helpful. Here are a few characteristics of effective feedback. First, it's prioritized. Choose what to provide feedback on. Don't provide too much feedback, which can be overwhelming to students and lead to feelings of hopelessness. What are the few most important things the student should focus on for improvement? Prioritize your feedback to include the most pressing issues and how students can improve rather than pointing out every little detail. Providing feedback um, effectively is also descriptive and constructive. Be specific in your feedback on student work. Rather than vague platitudes, provide specific areas a student excelled in using criteria language. Similarly, when a student needs improvement in an area, provide specific details about the student's areas for improvement. In other words, provide the student with evidence. Tell students specifically what they did well on and what they need to improve on. Effective feedback is also actionable. Be specific in telling students what they need to do with your feedback. What should they do differently next time? Be specific and make it clear what actions students need to take to resolve issues in their work and close gaps in their mastery of objectives. And finally, effective feedback is also timely. Give students feedback that comes in time for them to actually do something with it. If feedback doesn't come until two or three or four weeks later, it's lost its meaning and usefulness. Also, chances are students will have perpetuated the same mistakes in the meantime. So what do you think about these suggestions and strategies for equitable grading? Think about what your current grading practices are. What are some changes you'd like to make with your grading practices or policies? What do you think of some of the topics raised during this workshop? Consider these questions as you reflect on your grading practices and work toward more equity in your grading. Here's a by no means exhaustive list of resources you could use to start your journey toward developing more equitable grading practices and policies. I encourage you to explore these resources as applicable to your own teaching circumstances and needs. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. Thank you so much for joining me today to discuss developing fair, consistent, and transparent grading practices.